Um, well, brethren and sisters, we come to the, uh, the last chapter of uh, this wonderful epistle, the first epistle of John. And we've gone through the, uh, the outline of how the Apostle John shows the error of the Gnostic teaching and shows how the truth is really in Jesus Christ and abiding in the Father and in the Son. And in this last chapter, not surprisingly, uh, the Apostle John starts to pull together all the threads that have been in the earlier chapters. So where we are in terms of um, our structure is we're in the final major section, God is love. And we're going to deal with the last two subsections, truth and error, and sin and righteousness, as you can see there, and go right through to the epilogue of the epistle. Now, because the Apostle John is going to be drawing things together, he's going to be, if you like, summarising, which is not surprising, is it? But considering that um, the Apostle John's style is already quite condensed in terms of what he packs into a verse, now we discover there's even more that gets packed into a verse. So this is where we need to have our, uh, our mental abilities uh, fairly keen, and I know that's rather difficult when you've had two sessions already and it's, uh, I'm the only thing between you and lunch. So, <laughs> here we go. So we're going to be dealing now with the, the section on, um, on truth and error, the last section on truth and error. So in verse 4 of, uh, of 1 John 5, he says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, by which he means overcoming the three lusts. And he's almost quoting from uh, the gospel in John 16 and verse 33. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, says our Lord. I have overcome the world. And of course, he's saying that at the Last Supper, at the time of great pressure and, and uh, great trouble, the Lord had overcome the world. And... The term he uses in the second half of this verse is about the victory that overcomes the world. And the, and the Greek word for, that's translated victory there is Nike. We probably know that from the, the, uh, the sneakers that bear that name, Nike. And it literally means conquest in war. Which, of course, tells us, brethren and sisters, that overcoming the world is a war. There is a war to be waged. And we need to be constantly aware of that, don't we? We can't just drift through life. We've got to be aware that we are at war with the world, which is the lusts of the flesh that are in us. So the war is in here, isn't it, brethren and sisters? And what is the thing that's going to give us the ability to overcome, to win that war? Well, that's the point that the Apostle John's bringing out. Even our faith. Faith makes it possible to overcome the world. And... So, for example, we've got that classic chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, haven't we? Full of examples of people who overcame the world of their day. So, for example, Noah, Hebrews 11 verse 7, condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness of faith. We know that Abraham dwelt in tents waiting for the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Or Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. It's faith, isn't it, brethren and sisters, that inspires us to be able to win that war against the flesh. And that's what John's trying to convince his brethren in, that have remained after the Gnostics have gone, that they need to have that vital faith to overcome the flesh. Now, you know, we've got plenty of things that can excite us in faith, brethren and sisters. We've only got to have a look at the, uh, the current events that are happening and... Um, We've been well uh, encouraged in that in uh, most meal times. Um, our brother Grant has given us all sorts of examples. I just want to pick up one little example that to me I think is really amazing. And that is that I think that before our very eyes we're seeing the eastern leg of Nebuchadnezzar's image starting to emerge. The beginnings of the standing up of the image right ready for the stone to smite it. And you can see on the map that's shown there, we've got uh, in dark blue the European Union countries. And then Ukraine is picked out and 
well, I'm sure we all well know about the, the troubles that are happening in Ukraine, don't we, and the, the Russian overtures that are being made to drag Ukraine into the orbit of Russia. And you can see the line that's on this slide, which has been the traditional line between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, as it was right through the history of Rome. So we've got to see that, that split emerging. And at present, we've got the European Union spilling right over into the East where it doesn't belong. But you know, Mr. Putin is well on the way to fixing all of that. You're probably aware that the Eurasian Union was officially announced on the 29th of May. And just three days ago, uh, Mr. Putin also extended it to be the Eurasian Economic Union. And that was announced just three days ago. What's the Eurasian Union look like? Well, on the map, it looks a bit like this. It's only fairly uh, uh, small in numbers of countries. So you can see the green, there's Russia and Belarus and Kazakhstan. And there's some potential members, and you can see they've indicated Ukraine, and they've also highlighted in orange those that are unwilling to join. Well, they must be quite unwilling if Ukraine is uh, not amongst those that are unwilling to join, because Ukraine certainly doesn't seem to be. But, as we know, we expect Ukraine to end up reluctantly there. But you know, what Putin is doing, he is going flat out to build this union. It's not so uh, much in the mainstream media, but once you start looking in all sorts of other media, you find some interesting things. Iran is likely to join the Eurasian Union. Imagine that. That's another big chunk of Nebuchadnezzar's image, isn't it? It's the silver. So here's a, uh, Iran may become a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, says experts after a meeting between Iranian President Hassan Rouhani and Kazakh President, whoever his name is. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, you know, this, this is pretty profound. Another possible partnership, Turkey-Eurasian Union partnership will hurt Armenia. Goodness. So if Turkey joins the Eurasian Union, just think what that means. So Putin's going flat out, brethren and sisters, to to go ahead and build this Eurasian Union. So if we want things to look at that can encourage our faith, current events has really got it, hasn't it, brethren and sisters? It tells us that the Lord is not far away at all. So going on then back into um, uh, 1 John. In 1 John 5 and verse 5, he continues this thought about overcoming the world and we're familiar with the term that's used in the Apocalypse, aren't we, in Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the seven ecclesias about to him that overcometh. It's about overcoming the world, isn't it? Verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You might think, well, that's hardly a profound statement. Surely everyone believes that. But no, it's not like that at all. You see, the Gnostic had real trouble accepting that Jesus was the Son of God. The Gnostic view was that Jesus Christ, sorry, that Christ was the spirit that was separate from Jesus the man. And so that what they, what they said was that Christ just appeared to suffer. He appeared to, to, to walk on the earth. He appeared to be crucified, but it wasn't real. It was like a phantasm. And so this is why the Apostle John, I believe, uses the term Jesus here. So this is talking about our Lord in the days of his mortality, isn't it? That Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Son of God. So who, over, who can overcome the world? He that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. How does that work? Well, because our Lord did overcome the world, didn't he? And hence he becomes our example. And we can, we can look at his temptations uh, in the wilderness, can't we? Where he is tempted for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And we know that on every occasion he answered with scripture, didn't he? Straight away, instantly, just like that. And so we look at that and say, that's what we've got to do too, don't we? We need to have scripture at our fingertips so that when we are tempted, that we have something in our minds right ready to dispel that temptation. That's the example of the Lord, isn't it? But if you believe, as the Gnostics did, that it was just this phantasm and that it was Christ who was a spirit being and he wasn't really tempted anyway, all of a sudden the power of it all is lost, isn't it? Totally lost. So that's what he's saying. Now, he's now going to go on to uh, an interesting section talking about um, 
the three things that bear evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. But before we get into that, we need to pick up on some words that should be deleted. And somehow on my slide, this has got messed up. I hope if I press this button, got it. Um, so in uh, 1 John 5, if you didn't do this as part of the Bible marking yesterday, I suggest you do it now. You can see that the, from the word record in verse 7 through to in verse 8, the word earth should actually be deleted. This is a scribal insertion. It shouldn't be there. And you only got to read the words to realise why the scribe would put it in there. So there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. What a wonderful Trinitarian quote, isn't it? But even the Trinitarians these days back right away from it. But actually, you know, you can look at it and see that it's not genuine. Anyone see what the problem is with that? There's a logical problem with it. No? I guess you all perhaps know the answer, but you're just a bit too shy, like Brother Rodney Jansen's always shy, to, <laughs> to actually say anything. But why would there need to be an evidence in heaven that the, fa the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are anything? But God doesn't need evidences or records in heaven, does he? The only point of having evidences is on the earth for us. So clearly this is, just doesn't fit. Um, now, just some proof of this. Um, this section in 1 John 5 verse 7 was omitted in the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament of Erasmus, 1516. Now Erasmus created, if you like, the standard text from all the various uh, manuscripts that were around at that time to create a standard text from which there would be translations into English. Against his better judgment, he incorporated it into the third edition in 1522. And that then became Textus Receptus in 1550, which is the actual textual base for uh, our, uh, our Bible. Now, just thought I'd give you a quote from Adam Clark's commentary. Adam Clark is a Trinitarian, and yet he sees that this particular section is, uh, is wrong. He says, It is likely that this verse is not genuine. It is wanting in every manuscript of this epistle, written before the invention of printing, one accepted, the Codex Montforti, in Trinity College, Dublin. Interesting that it's in Trinity College, isn't it? And it advocates the Trinity. Anyway, it is wanting in both the Syriac, all the Arabic, Ethiopic, Coptic, Sahardic, Armenian, Slovenian, etc., in a word, in all the ancient versions but the Vulgate. And even of this version, many of the most ancient and correct manuscripts have it not. So it's not there. It's a scribal insertion. Now, if you go back, get your Bibles and have a look at Exodus chapter 20. And theistic evolutionists say that there's another scribal insertion here in Exodus 20 verse 11. So in Exodus chapter 20 verse 11, it's in the midst of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? So we'll read for context, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy God. In it thou shalt do no work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, you can see why a theistic evolutionist would like to have that verse out. And so they argue that it's a scribal insertion because when you have a look at the parallel record in Deuteronomy, where there is the record of the Ten Commandments, this is not in there. So they argue it's not actually in and that it's a scribal insertion. Now, there's absolutely no evidence for that because all of the manuscripts have this verse in it. And also, they have a little cunning trick around this. They say... Well, if you ask them, is this an inspired inscribal insertion or not inspired? In my experience, they always say it's an inspired inscribal insertion at about the time of Daniel. They think it was put in. Well, there's a very easy reason to show that this can't be the case, brethren and sisters, because 
Think of this. When the covenant was dedicated, Exodus 24, and the covenant was dedicated with blood, wasn't it? Moses took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So here was the official covenant. If Exodus 20 verse 11 was, miss was missing, they didn't actually commit to the proper covenant, did they? So therefore, the word is not actually inspired. We've now got part of, oh, sorry, partial inspiration in the scriptures. So it's a really serious issue. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that to you because theistic evolutionists will say Exodus 20 verse 11 is a scribal insertion just like 1 John 5 verse 7. Okay, let's get back to 1 John. So let's start dealing with the record in 1 John 5 and verse 6. And John says, concerning that Jesus is the Son of God from the previous verse, this is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. So what's he talking about here? I've sort of paraphrased the beginning of, of verse 6. He is come through water and blood. It's only a minor difference. So is this talking about the water and blood that came out of the side of the Lord in um, John chapter 19, verse 34? You remember that after he was dead, the, the, uh, the soldiers came along and thrust a spear into the side of the Lord. And so it says in uh, verse 34 of uh, John chapter 19, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith there came out blood and water. So is that what it's referring to? Well, it doesn't appear to be, brethren and sisters, to me, and if anyone wants to discuss it, I'd be very pleased to discuss it afterwards, because it says the context of the verse is this is he that came by water and blood. Having a spear thrust in his side at the end of his life is hardly him coming by water and blood. So I would suggest, rather, that what it indicates is that the water refers to Christ's baptism and the blood refers to his crucifixion. Why is this significant? Because in relation to both of those events, there is the statement by the Father that Jesus is the Son, which is what John is proving. Jesus is the Son of God. So when the Lord was baptised, Luke 3, and that's with water, isn't it? The statement was of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The blood concerning his crucifixion, well, there wasn't the word from heaven at that point, but in uh, Luke chapter 9, where we've got the record of the transfiguration, um, we read these words concerning... Um, <clears throat> so here was the Lord with Moses and Elijah. And what were they talking about? Verse 31. They appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. We know that word for decease is the Greek word exodus. The exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. In other words, his crucifixion. And what then happened? Verse 35, and there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. So here is twice the divine assertion that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the son of God. And of course that then countermanded what uh, the, the uh, Gnostics were saying, that Jesus was a phantasm and that his baptism and his crucif crucifixion were, were not real events. Well, there were clearly evidence that they were real events, weren't they? I think also there's an interesting implication here that the Gnostics had partaken of water in baptism, but re really refused the full process. They were resisting putting the, death, putting the flesh to death, which is, of course, a vital part of being a disciple of the Lord, isn't it? Now, the Apostle John then starts to extend this. He's talked about water and blood. And then says, verse 7, for there are three that bear record. And this is where we've got to have in our Bibles that bit deleted. Three that bear record. What are they? We jump to verse 8. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So why has he gone from two to now three? He's added in the spirit. Why has he done that? Well, I would suggest that it's because of the traditional Jewish approach that Three are required to bear record. Deuteronomy 19, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So here is his three witnesses. So he's now adding the third witness. 
the Spirit. How does the Spirit witness to Jesus Christ being the Son of God? Well, in two ways, because the Spirit here presumably represents the Holy Spirit, and there were the miracles of the Lord that showed clearly that he was, um, that he was the Son of God, because, <clears throat> as Nicodemus says, no man can do these things except that he is sent from God. There were also the Old Testament prophecies the old, the, the, that were inspired by the Holy Spirit that spoke of, uh, of, in fact, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got all three of these witnessing that Christ came in the flesh. Now, <clears throat> oops, I've gone to the wrong slide. Hang on, I'll just go back to that one. I wonder also if there isn't a bit of an allusion here to the inauguration of the priesthood. Because when Moses, sorry, when Aaron was inaugurated by Moses, there was in fact a threefold process, wasn't there, in Leviticus chapter 8. First of all, in Leviticus 8 verse 6, Moses takes the priests, Aaron and his sons, and washed them. And then in verse 23, they were sprinkled with blood and they were anointed, a symbol of the spirit. So you've got the same threefold evidence or the same threefold process involved. Now, Brother Thomas in uh, Eureka picks this up and applies a, a different dimension to this, which I in fact, in fact think is quite right. He extends this concept of the three witnesses to our becoming in Christ. So he says, Eureka, volume one, page 282, the spirit, the water and the blood are the three witnesses on the earth that are convergent in the one name, 1 John 5, verse 8. We've read that. The spirit, which is the truth, works in him, in other words, a person like us, who understands it to believe, to will, and to do. The water is the medium of induction into the name, in other words, our baptism. The third witness is the blood, by faith in the testimony concerning the sin-covering efficacy of the blood of Jesus. I thought that was a rather interesting observation, isn't it? that the witnesses to that Jesus Christ is the Son of God are actually the same three things that are witnesses of our association with him and salvation that is associated with it. Now, moving along, we come to a... Uh, sorry, I've got to go back. In verses 10 and 11 of First uh, John 5, we end up with yet another witness. And... You can probably see that he's starting to pull things together here, the, the threads of other things that, that John has talked about. So in verse 10 he says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So what he's saying is, we have a record in ourselves that Jesus is the Son of God. Why is that? Because if we're trying to live aeonian or eternal life now, then that's an evidence of God abiding in us, which can only happen if Jesus is the Son of God. You see the logic? Because we wouldn't live aeonian life, in other words, the character of the life of the age to come in this day, except that there were the influence of God upon us, would there? Because the, it's totally counter to the flesh. So you can see the idea of Aeonian life starting to come into this. Now, next section I want to look at is, there's a little aside here on prayer in verses 14 and 15. And, uh, you know, of course, prayer is an absolutely vital thing. And he says, and this is the confidence that, that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So why does he suddenly introduce that now? Why say, why are we suddenly jumping into a very nice little aside on prayer? Well, I think, brethren and sisters, that, that the reason for it is because perhaps if brethren felt that living the Ionian life was just a little too hard for them, what do we do? We're faced with the same situation, aren't we? We know what's required to, to live the life of the age to come to perfectly manifest God's love in our lives. And it's perhaps a little beyond us. What, we do, what do we do? We ask God for help, don't we? 
And so that's what I believe the Apostle John is doing here, is encouraging his readers, if you've got trouble with living the Aeonian life now, well then, ask God. Because we know that if we ask anything in, according to his will, he heareth us. That's an amazing consolation, isn't it? If we ask anything according to God's will, he will hear us and he will do it. And you know, that, that's what uh, John has said in uh, well, the words of the Lord in John 15 and verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words in you, ye shall ask and it shall be done for you. Because the key thing is asking according to his will, isn't it? When you're perhaps a very young person, you can think, well, I can ask for anything I want. You know, I could ask for a new car or lots of money or a nice holiday or some new clothes. But no, it's things according to the will, isn't it? And so Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8 the Lord says, Ask and it shall be given you, for every one that asketh receiveth. Whereas James says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Then we go on to um, a section which um, I think there has been a reasonable amount of debate on. This is verses 16 and 17. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall. Give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. So, what is the sin unto death? Pretty serious thing, isn't it? Because it's, it's not forgivable, is it? If This sin unto death. So, what is it? Well, I guess, first of all, all sin is unto death, really, except for grace. Now, is he referring to the habitual sins of the Gnostic? Or perhaps is he referring to the unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? How can we work this out? Well, I think if it was referring to the habitual sins of the Gnostic, we, we, we would not have sin in the singular. Because you notice it says, if any man see his brother sin a sin, so this is singular, which is not unto death. And then it talks about there is a sin unto death. Whereas the Gnostic had the philosophy that I can just let sin run right through my life. It's, it's a continuous thing. Sin is just keeping on running. So I think it is actually the latter, that it's talking about the unforgivable sin, which is in Matthew chapter 12. If we turn there, in Matthew chapter 12, we see the statement of the Lord that there is an unforgivable sin. What is this unforgivable sin? Matthew 12 and verse 31 Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Before we explore the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, isn't it amazing, the first part of the verse? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. In other words, apart from this one little category, everything else, there's nothing that we can do that can't be forgiven. You know, sometimes we can think we're beyond the pale. And I think a classic example, as Brother Ron has brought out, is Manasseh. You know, Manasseh. Think of all the bad things he did. And he turns to God at the end and God forgives him. You think, how can that happen? What an amazing God we have. So we're never beyond the pale, except if we commit this sin, which I don't think we can actually do these days. And that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So why did the Lord say this at this particular point? Well, because he'd done a miracle in, in uh, previous verses and he'd made the, the blind and the dumb to, to speak in verse 22. But in verse 24, the Pharisees heard it and they said, this fellow doth cast out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. So they're announcing that to all the people looking on. But they actually knew that he had power of God to do it didn't they? Because Nicodemus said that. We know that thou art from God because no man could do these miracles except he is from God. So they knew that the power that he had was from God and yet they attributed it to a pagan God, a God of evil. That was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So another comparable thing is um, in Hebrews chapter 6, where we again get told that something's not going to be forgiven. Hebrews 6 and verse 4 to 6. 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What's the circumstances here? This is talking to the Hebrews who were inclined to go back to Judaism. They were losing their zeal and enthusiasm for the things of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they, they were inclined to go back to the synagogue. But of course, if they went back to the synagogue, what would they have to do? We know what they'd have to do. They would have to renounce Christ. They would have to say that he was actually a fraud and he wasn't real. And yet these people had the Holy Spirit gifts. So wouldn't that be absolute blasphemy against the Holy Spirit to go back to the synagogue, say Jesus Christ is a fraud uh, and oops, I've got the Holy Spirit and I've done all these things, all these marvellous miracles through the power that the Lord has given me and I'm now denying him. So I think that's what is, uh, the Apostle Paul is meaning here. So in terms of the, the sin that is the sin unto death, I think what's, what's being talked about in 1 John is that there probably would have been, in fact, I'm almost certain there would have been, brethren and sisters at this point who still had the power of the Holy Spirit gifts. This is not yet the end of the first century. The Holy Spirit gifts hadn't died out until some years later. And so you imagine the circumstances of some brethren that had the Holy Spirit gifts and they now denied that Jesus Christ was come in the flesh. That would be just the limit, wouldn't it? That's not allowable. That could not be forgiven at all. So I think that's what it's talking about, brethren and sisters, in terms of um, the sin unto death. For the Gnostics who'd had the Holy Spirit and to say that Jesus was not the Christ and did not come into the flesh was unforgivable. Now we come to the concluding summary of 1 John 5 and indeed all of 1 John. And you can see it's in the familiar three-part arrangement that has characterised so much of the structure of John. And this has really got it packed in. But there's some really lovely things in here for us too, brethren and sisters. So what I've done is I've paraphrased um, verse 18 a little. But you can see the threefold structure. It starts with we know. So I've underlined those. But this time the word know is not gnosko, know by experience. This is the Greek word oida. And here it carries the idea of to understand. So what's he doing? He's in effect stating what our understandings are as a result of this epistle. Verse 18. We understand that whosoever is born of God doesn't practice sin. So he's concluding these things with statements of understanding. That's often how official documents happen today, isn't it? If there's a, a contract or a a, um, a report on something, it'll often finish up by saying, we understand that this and this and this is true. So that's the way it appears that the Apostle John is concluding things. Now, I've put things in various colours here because these are the themes that are now being drawn together. Born of God has been a big theme, hasn't it? And you can see that in green. The world, verse 19, is a big theme. And, and the world's wickedness you can, is also a very big theme. In verse 20, you can see the word know, gnosko, to know as in to have experiential knowledge is a big theme. And concluding at the bottom is eternal life. So what's he saying there? We've sort of done the analysis to see he's pulling the threads together. He's saying these are the final statements. What does it mean? He's saying we understand that whosoever is born of God doesn't practice sin. He doesn't say that in... Uh, in the AV, it says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And we, we, we saw that back in chapter 3 that the Apostle John expounded this, that where it's sin in the present continuous tense, it's talking about practicing sin, which is, of course, what the Gnostic did. So whosoever is really born of God won't do what the Gnostic has done. But he that is begotten of God guards himself, which is... Not what the AV says, it says the, uh, the AV says keepeth himself, but it's, it's the word terio, which means to guard. So he that is begotten of God guards himself and wickedness, the AV says, the wicked one toucheth him not. And that's an important thing, isn't it, brethren and sisters? It's one thing to be born of God by water and to be baptised, 
But then the rest of our lives, we need to guard ourselves, don't we, against wickedness, to keep wickedness out of our lives, that it doesn't touch us. Verse 19, and we know, that is, we understand, here's another summary point, that we are of God. In other words, those who are not like the Gnostics are really of God, ek, out of God. And the whole world, in contrast, lieth in wickedness. So we've got to be different to that. We've got to be different to the world. The world is something that we don't want to partake of. Verse 20, and we know, rather, we understand, our third summary point, that the Son of God is come, and he doesn't put this in, but it's implied, in the flesh. Because Jesus has been proving that. And hath given us an understanding that we might know him. In other words, know by experience. Have an experiential relationship with him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So we can be in the true God and the evidence of us doing that is by living that Ionian life now. So that's his conclusion, except he has one last verse. And he says, verse 21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. You might think, well, this is a conclusion. How come we've just got a totally new thought introduced in the last verse? There's not been mention of idolatry at all in the, in, in the whole of the epistle up to this point. So what's he saying? Well, I think he's really in a, in a very pithy way, saying, my little children, keep yourself away from false conceptions of God. Because that's what idols were. They were false conceptions of God, weren't they? And they were surrounded with them. You know, he's writing to the Ephesians, and here is a you know, picture of Diana of the Ephesians. And there's Baal there as well. And the, these were the gods that they would have been seeing all the time. And the Gnostic beliefs were just like that. They were a false conception of God. And as a contrast, of course, with verse 20, this is the true God. Here is the false gods. So what, brethren and sisters, have we learnt out of our time looking at the first epistle of John? The aged apostle, who's written to these brethren and sisters in Asia Minor, and he's also written to us, hasn't he? The things that he's written are truly profound, and we've not really covered anywhere near all of it, brethren and sisters. We've sort of skated across the surface and just ever so often dived down to go to a bit of depth like we did in early parts of chapter 1 and then come up and stayed really at the top level. So what have we learnt? Well, I think we've learnt some things that are very relevant to our theme that is here. Striving to keep the truth in challenging days. The Apostle John uncompromisingly says we should defend the truth against error. You remember he talked about Antichrist and that it's wrong. And later in 2 John, he points out that those that believe that error can't be fellowshipped. He's absolutely black and white on that. He might be an aged apostle. He might be mellowed. But there's no way in the world will he tolerate error. And neither should we, brethren and sisters. But throughout this epistle, there is a balance, you see. Because in defending against error, one can become rather harsh and hard and can be consumed with negativity and so what the Apostle does, I believe, is remind us that we need to maintain personal righteousness and guard against sin, something very important in our lives. The world in which we live has no concept of sin. We have to have that concept alive so that we are sensitive to it and therefore we stay away from sin. And that we should also show agape love to our brethren, even to those who might be giving us a very hard time because we're opposing them. And Well, when I say opposing them, I'm meaning more opposing the errors that they uphold. And I think that's the distinction we need to make. And it's difficult, isn't it? When someone is giving you a hard time to say, I hate the things that they are saying because they're wrong, but I love the brother, I love the person. In other words, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. I think it's an important distinction. And boy, it's hard to do, isn't it, brethren and sisters? Another thing that he tells us is to love not the world, neither the things of the world. So important in our age, our age of materialism. We're all so well off, really. 
We've only got to travel to third world countries to realise how well off we really are. But we can be consumed with it. It can take our time, it can take our energies. And so that the, the truth can just get snuffed right out because we've got all our time on other things, haven't, haven't we? And the challenge, brethren and sisters, to live that eternal life now, to live now the qualities and the character of the life that is to come, right now. It's a wonderful thought, but it's a challenge to us so that we can enjoy that joyous life in the kingdom and that we may know that we know the Father and the Son. So if we have any doubts as to whether we really have a personal relationship with the Father and the Son, and sometimes we can have those doubts, John gives us this very simple test. If we're keeping his commandments, we have the relationship. We don't have to worry. If we're keeping his commandments, we have that relationship. And so, brethren and sisters, we come to our end of our study on 1 John, and I hope that it's been uh, helpful to you. I find it a fascinating book, one that really makes me think deeply about my relationship with God and my living of the truth, and I pray that it might have benefited you to the same end. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.